Hello and welcome. My name is Stacey Bersani, Program Manager for IEEE Ada Kappa Nu. IEEE is the world's largest technical professional organization dedicated to advancing technology for the benefit of humanity. We thank you all for joining us on our webinar today. Before we begin, please note a few housekeeping items. At the bottom of your screen are engagement tools that you can use. All tools are resizable and movable, so feel free to move them around to make the most out of your space. Note that we recommend using a wired internet connection to access today's presentation and closing any programs or browser sessions running in the background that could cause issues. There is no dial-in number for this event. Please make sure your computer speakers or headset are turned on and the volume is up so that you can hear our presenters. You can find additional answers to some common technical issues by clicking the orange question mark or help icon at the bottom of your screen. If you have any questions for today's presenters, you can submit them through the Q&A widget on your screen or click the purple Q&A icon at the bottom of the screen. We will answer as many questions as time allows. If you click the green resources icon at the bottom of your screen, you'll find more information about upcoming events, including our June 5th graduation celebration. We hope to see you all there. Finally, the on-demand link for today's event will be emailed to all registrants. Our virtual event today is HKN Graduate Student Panel, The Inside Scoop. If you would like to post on Facebook about this event, please use the hashtag IAMHKN. At this time, I'd like to hand it over to IEEE HKN Director Nancy Oston. Well, thank you all for joining us. I'm really excited about our panel today, the Graduate Student Panel, The Inside Scoop. We're going to hear from graduate students about going to graduate school and what it's like to apply to think about, to choose, to make all the many decisions that go into attending graduate school, and then dealing with being in graduate school and what does that mean. And I think we're going to get a lot of great advice from our four, um, actually five, at a Kappa new students who are with us today, all who are graduate students themselves or in programs themselves um, from, from four different wonderful universities. So I think we have a great um, realm of perspectives. And um, I know we have fabulous people because I get to work with these wonderful students quite often. I'm going to turn this immediately over to Katie Brinker, who Katie Brinker is the, uh, was a former student governor of IEEE HKN. So she does, still does a lot of work on behalf of HKN and is the co-chair of our PR and Communications Committee and works on, is working with uh, Joe Green, who's also on the program today, and Zeus Gannon joining us as well and developing a graduate student program for Etta Kappa Nu. So I think um, maybe we'll hear a little bit more about that too. So Katie, let me just throw this right over to you. You can introduce the other panelists and uh, take us, get us going here. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you, Nancy. And again, welcome everybody to our panel today. Um, today our panel is comprised of five graduate students. And this, this was done purposefully because we don't want to look at graduate school through an admissions lens or a program advertisement lens today. Instead, we want to you know, have a platform to share our experiences openly and honestly, and also answer any questions that you all have. Um, so I do really encourage you to ask questions, to put things into the Q&A uh, box. Um, we'll try to get to as many questions as possible. And uh, while we're asking these questions to the panelists too, we're not going to use anybody's name. So if you have a question, you're worried about it being associated with you, don't worry about that. We're not going to say your name when we ask these questions to our panelists. So don't let that hold you back. So again, I really encourage you to put in your questions. We want to answer what's on your mind and tell you about our experiences. So with that, I'm going to kick off the introductions. Uh, like Nancy said, my name is Katie Brinker. I'm a PhD candidate at Iowa State University in electrical engineering. Just took my qualifying exam a couple weeks ago, so I'm still getting used to saying candidate rather than PhD student. <laughs> um, but I transferred to Iowa State from Missouri s and in the fall of 2019. And my research is in the area of chipless RFID for structural health monitoring, as well as microwave non-destructive testing. Here at Iowa State, we have the Center for Non-Destructive Evaluation, so that's kind of how that all fits in. And I'm also a recipient of the NASA Space Technology Research Fellowship, and I'm also a NASA Pathways intern. So I can kind of speak to the experience of doing a master's and then deciding to go on to a PhD, having a fellowship, doing internships during grad school, transferring, 
all those kind of things, um, and just happy to answer any questions. So with that, I am going to kick it over to the next intro, which is from Joe. Great, thank you so much, Katie. Well, first and foremost, you know, nice to see everyone part of the uh, panel here today. I think we're going to have a lot of fun, you know, pulling back the layers about grad school. There's definitely a few aspects that I wish I knew going into the program, and I think we're going to have a productive conversation seeing how each of our experiences brought us to grad school. Well, first and foremost, to tell you a little bit about myself, I just finished my second year of my PhD program at Boston University. There I studied computational imaging, which is the combination of algorithms algorithms like deep learning and traditional optical design to try to push the limitations of conventional imaging platforms. And I gear my research towards neuroscience, specifically neurophotonics or the imaging of the brain. I actually did both my master's and my bachelor's at Boston University as well. Um, honestly, it was a little unintended staying for both the master's and now the PhD, but it's a choice I do not regret at all. It's been a phenomenal time. So if you're ever interested in learning a little bit more about why you might want to stay at the same university. I can talk a little bit to that end. And as well, I don't want to give the illusion, I know there's a bad stigma that in uh, grad school you can't do anything, but you know, work-life balance is important and I try to keep things spiced up with a couple of hobbies like dance, music, hackathons, and other small engineering projects with my roommate. Um, so yeah, that's me. And now we'll pass it over to Zeus. Hi, thanks Joe. Uh, so my name is Zeus Gannon. I am a master's student at the University of Kansas in uh, electrical engineering. Um, I received my bachelor's from KU um, in 2019, and I came from a local community college. Uh, so I started off doing classes there, transferred as many as I could to university, uh, so I can talk from that sort of perspective. Um, my research is in um, radar remote sensing, and you can see a few pictures there in my slide. I've got a little um, uh, measuring the length of a UAV propeller blade using microdoppler response. Um, my master's thesis is actually making a radar test spread out of ultrasonic equipment, uh, which has some advantages to it. Um, and I put my hobbies on there as I, I play a lot of video games. So <laughs> that's what I do to try and reduce the stress from grad school. Um, so that's me. I'll turn it over to Liam. Hey, I'm Liam. I'm a PhD student at the University of South Alabama. Um, I come from, my, ba my bachelor's degree was in computer engineering, um, and I'm getting my master's degree in electrical engineering, but I'm pivoting over to systems. Um, but my research so far really involves content adaptive memory, um, which really long story short is a good way to save on power or to logically expand a memory circuit into something more. Um, like here's uh, one of the papers that I'm actually trying to get published to IEEE Explore. I think next week is when we can actually send it. Um, but um, when it comes to grad school, um, I personally enjoy doing this because um, I did spend some time working in the IT field and getting some real world experience at Packaging Corporation of America. Um, but I mean, I don't know. I'm having a blast at graduate school, so that's kind of why I came back for more. Because I'm just, I'm just having fun with it. Oh, hi, Kitty. Um, <laughs> but yeah, that's me. Um, and I guess I'm going to pass it over to Mahalia so you can introduce herself. Hi, um, I'm Mahalia. I'm a master's candidate at University of South Alabama. Uh, computer engineering is what I'm aiming for right now. I got my bachelor's in electrical engineering at Seattle University before um, deciding to do grad school actually in um, my hometown where my parents live, which has been pretty fun to get to actually spend some time with my family. And my research area for uh, for my master's right now is on using machine learning to help automate the diagnosis of Parkinson's disease using uh, EEG. Um, and it's been really cool to get to look at sort of the medical field of electrical engineering. And uh, I am excited to hear y'all's questions and get to chat a little bit about what grad school is like. I'll pass it back over to Katie. Great, thank you. So let's kind of, I guess, set the stage a little bit. And let's, let's kind of talk a little bit about what made us want to go to grad school in the first place. Um, so I don't know who wants to start with this one. Um, 
Zeus, do you want to go first? What What made you want to go to grad school? Was it, you know, a specific career path that you wanted to take or, you know, just something that you wanted to do for you? What What kind of led to this path for you? Gosh, well, there's a, a couple answers to that one. Uh, one of them was I really personally enjoy learning. You know, I finished with my bachelor's and it was like, I feel like I'm just starting to learn the interesting things and I want to know more. Um, another aspect of that is, you know, in my particular circumstance, um, I was with some undergraduate research and they were willing to fund my master's program. So it was sort of a, it'd be a bad idea not to. <laughs> um, and then probably the most realistic of the reasons is that it sort of delayed what I'm going to do with the rest of my life <laughs> for me to think about later. So that's not something that we usually like to talk about, but it's definitely a, was a motivator for me. <laughs> yeah, I, I totally understand that. And I can relate a little bit in my, in my own path to grad school, but does anybody else want to go next and talk about what made them want to go yeah. to grad school? Yeah, sure. Um, so I actually had the opportunity in my undergraduate, um, the very last year, senior year, um, I had asked one of the professors, one of the ones I work for now, Dr. Nagong, um, if she was interested, if I could help her in the lab as an undergraduate researcher. Um, and she actually took me up on the offer where I got to mess around in the lab. Um, and at that point, I was kind of expecting to get my bachelor's and kind of walk away. But I don't know, I had a lot of fun with the research in the lab just as an undergraduate. Um, and I, I definitely appreciated that when it came to research, it was a very hands-off, like I got to do really what I wanted. If I didn't like the topic, there were other topics I could pick from. Um, so I don't know, I found it exciting and I'm really just here for the fun of it, but. Yeah, yeah, Mahalia or Joe, do you wanna talk to this next? I, sure. Um, for me, it was, I, I graduated with my bachelor's in December of 2019. And that fall I was applying to grad school and also applying to jobs. And then spring came and I was working as an educator at a local elementary school. And then the pandemic hit and all of the jobs I was applying to sort of started vanishing and grad school started looking like a really good option. And I started looking more at what grad school I would wanna to go to of the ones I'd applied to. and coming back home seemed nice to get to come home during a pandemic since I knew I was going to be at home. And then also I, I found out that there was research going on that I was really interested in. And I mostly chose grad school because I wanted a chance to get to know some topics that I was interested in undergrad, but I didn't get to like deep dive into. And I think for me, that's ultimately why I picked grad school is to get a little bit of a chance to just focus and study one thing instead of trying to learn all of the basics. Cause I think bachelor's is a bit of a speed run to like learn everything <laughs> possible in like four years. So, um, so for me, that's really what decided it for me. You know, uh, Mahalia, I can definitely relate to that. And I, I appreciate hearing about that personal journey. I felt very similar at the end of my bachelor's. It's like I did a little bit of research. I expanded my coursework in different directions. And at the end of my EE degree, it's like the only thing I knew was I liked EE. And um, really what happened is my, my senior year, I took a computational imaging course. And of course, up until this point, besides like the required courses, I haven't really like dived into optics or computations too terribly much. And I'm like, this is awesome. And I know nothing. So I went to the, uh, the professor and he was, you know, appreciative of my ambition. And I managed to uh, talk him basically into allowing me to do this master's thesis because I was really contemplating at the time, you know, do I want to stay for a master's and learn more, go into industry and see how that is. But I, I saw, and this is also pretty similar to Zeus, I saw an opportunity. And I'm like, okay, if I can leverage this relationship to learn in the field that I want, why not pursue it and expand my horizons, even if I'm staying at the same university? So that's how I got into the master's. And then the PhD was a short hop from there. You know, the, the PI was pretty satisfied how the master's came out and uh, offered to sponsor me for the whole PhD. So that's how I ended up enrolled in that program as a continuation of the work I found interesting in his course. Yeah, yeah. So for me, um... I guess I, I also started doing undergraduate research my junior year. And then after my junior year, I did a internship at Southwest Research Institute in between junior and senior year that summer. And at the end of that internship, um, they made me a full-time offer for after I finished my bachelor's degree. And at that time, as like a 21-year-old, I was like, there's 
there is no way <laughs> I I am ready to be a full time employee for you in a year. Like I I kind of say that I went to grad school because I had imposter syndrome. And that's kind of ironic because grad school is known for giving people imposter syndrome. <laughs> but um, it, it was kind of that dynamic of, you know, I don't know if I'm ready. I don't know if I have enough knowledge in this field yet. So let me maybe stay and get a master's and then maybe I'll feel more prepared, more ready, more technically confident, those kind of things. Um, and at the time, the the person I was doing undergraduate research with um, had been encouraging me to go to grad school anyways. So that was kind of a good fit there to stay at the same university, stay working in that lab and pursue a master's. And so he helped me apply for graduate fellowship, the NASA Space Technology Research Fellowship, which I ended up getting to fund my master's. And as part of that fellowship, you get to do research at a NASA center for 10 weeks a year. And while I was doing that research, that was when I kind of had that light bulb moment of like, oh, this is what I want to do with my life. This is what I want my career to be. Um, but how do I make that happen? Well, you kind of need a PhD to, to be a research scientist in that branch. And so that was when I decided I should, I should stay for the PhD after finishing up the master's. And here we are. <laughs> so along the same lines, you know, kind of a follow-up question for you all is, what do you hope to do after you finish your graduate degree? Do you want to go into industry? Or are you more so national lab type thing, academia, policy? You know, what's it for you after after you finish up? Anyone want to take this one oh, first? Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll go first. Um, so I, I really don't have a clear plan yet because I'm still a few years away from graduation, but my anticipation is that, at least so far in research, every time I get to touch AI and neural networks, I really enjoy it. Um, and those ast astronomically explode when you get in the private sector, um, from what I've been told. So, so from my perspective, I would like to spend some time in that field to just see what's out there proprietary-wise. and. Um, to take a look at that and see if it's fun. Um, but I've, I've spent some time working as like a teaching assistant as part of my graduate program. Um, and I found that fairly interesting. So even though I anticipate to go to the private sector, um, coming back and possibly being a professor, it doesn't seem like a bad idea. Um, but of course, I'm, I'm a few years away. I'm still pondering. But the, the main objective is I'm going to go out and I'm going to go into industry and see, see how fun it is over there. You know, um, I really appreciate that perspective, Liam. And I think that's the million dollar question like anyone in a grad or PhD program asks themselves. It's like, where do you want to end up after doing all this awesome learning? And it sounds like, well, at least on my path and on a couple of our paths, the learning really took the initiative into why we wanted to go into grad school. And I often find myself contemplating like, what's the next evolution of that? On one side, you could argue academia, but you know, academic positions are hard to find and even harder to see through to like a solid tenure track position. Like I, I have a relatively new PI, like he joined in my undergrad to the university and really seeing how like pursuing the tenure track has weighed on him and even changed his personality to the to some degree makes me a little apprehensive when it comes to academia. And there's another good argument I heard from a friend who actually went out, got his PhD, and then created a startup off of his own technology. It's like, I could never imagine being tied down to the same place, doing this, uh, the same place in the same environment for 20 years. And there's kind of that nice lesson that I kind of like about, similarly, industry is it's always evolving. It's always Always, you know, new environments, new people, you know, trading, you know, companies, jobs and ideas and the idea of going into this private sector and trying to grow, learn and advance amongst all these new environments, I find particularly enthusiasm. And so I think similarly, I would like to go into the private sector afterwards. But I mean, mine's not 100 percent made up. Still got a couple more years between here and there. Yeah. Yeah, Mahalia and Zeus, what about you? Um, um, I, can... I, oh, sorry, go ahead, Zeus. <laughs> All right, um, so, so my, my plan for after grad school is I plan to go work for a while, but um, one of the things when I was in my undergrad and graduate is the teachers I liked the best always had the most real world experience. So 
my personal goal is to go out and, you know, work for 10, 15, 20 years and then come back to a, a university or institute and then continue teaching basically what I've learned while I've been out there. That's it. Um, for me, it's kind of uh, similar to you, Katie. I've realized that what I want to do, I kind of might need a PhD for. So I'm actually starting the application process of GAN of figuring out where I might want to do a PhD because my research has been so cool and interesting. And I am realizing I really want to work in the biomedical engineering field. And I'm still learning a lot about it and what kind of jobs exist, which I think is one of the interesting things about doing electrical engineering and the various branches is there's so many different things you can do. And I feel like every day I'm hearing about a job that I just didn't even know existed. And um, so I'm excited to see like what happens, but I'm starting to think that more grad school might be next for me, which is a little bit weird because I didn't think I was going to want to stay in school. <laughs> right, right. I, I totally relate to that. And, you know, kind of along similar lines, you know, we have a question here about what have you learned about becoming a better learner so far? And I think with grad school, a lot of it is just knowing how to learn, knowing how to dig into a new problem, especially for research-based degrees too, I would say, you know, you're kind of really focused on a specific problem that you're trying to solve over a couple of years to several years, you know? So does anybody have any perspective on just learning how to become a better learner? Uh, I've got something um, I can talk about I, for that. <laughs> Sorry, I stepped on your toes. <laughs> um, yeah, go ahead. So it's, it's something that I caught on towards the end of my undergraduate uh, education is that, especially for electrical engineering, a lot of the classes, although they don't seem like it at first, they're all interrelated. And being able to see the ties between the different subjects uh, is really important. So if you're working on a certain project, don't only focus on, well, what's the theory or of applications immediately relevant to this project. Also look outside a little bit and see if there might be some ties to other fields um, that could help you bring new insights into what you're currently working on. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Amalia, I was have... gonna add. Oh, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> oh. Uh, oh, sorry, yeah, I'll let, I'll let Mahalia go next, but um, I was just gonna add what really helped me learn and helped me study um, was really getting in the field and getting to know people. Because um, really, the interaction with people is what really makes or breaks it for me. Because um, I work in a lab with a bunch of people, and I may not necessarily see them every day, um, but we have just a casual chat room where they'll be doing some research and find something in, in my ballpark, and they'll just pass the paper my way. And it's really engaging in that regard, because I have other people from different perspectives that I can talk to and discuss this. And it, it becomes like, hab like a habitual, like a habit to just you know get in there and just talk about it and enjoy it. Um, so really, if you can get that group of people who you like working with, they can really help you study and help you, you know, understand the material. Um, but I'll pass it over to Mahalia. Um, I think I, similar to the what um, what Liam said and also what Zeus said about, I, you know, the people and then seeing the interconnection, the thing that I think grad school has helped me become a better student and learner in is being more aware of the level of collaboration it takes to do everything. In, in every class, you need to talk to your peers and find out if they have similar questions to you. And um, I think in grad school, I've learned how to ask better questions. And I think that has helped me a lot. And not being afraid to like go to classmates and say, like, did you understand this part? And then try to talk it through together and then go to the professor and say, this is kind of the best question we have of like, that would help us figure things out. And also just learning to be more open to asking questions of professors, whether you're in their class or not. And if you know they're in the field that you have a question about, just reaching out and, and getting used to that sort of level of collaboration. Yeah, definitely. And I, I think something that's also helped me too is that in grad school, I get to pick classes that are interesting to me and, and will help me with my research. You know, sometimes in undergrad, it's like you have to take a power class and you have to take a VLSI class and you have to take these five programming classes. And that's great to get that foundation and kind of explore different things. But, you know, sometimes you find out something's not your cup of tea and that makes it a little bit sometimes challenging to want to learn that thing. So being able to say, oh, 
this class sounds really cool and that'll help me with my research or tying it back to your research to like, oh, we're learning this thing in statistics. How can that help me? Maybe mm -hmm. I can do this whole new analysis for this project that I'm working on or something. So it becomes a little bit more grounded in some sort of project or something that I care about already. And that's, that's something that's helped me just be more motivated to learn that. Yeah, for sure. And um, I guess one thing that struck me upon joining grad school, especially like a PhD, is just how independent your learning becomes. And not in the sense that you don't collaborate or talk with others or anything like that, but it goes from, you know, a professor in front of you teaching you everything you need to know to succeed to really needing to look outside of that picture. How does this aspect of this one course interplay with this paper I read or this other course, and how can I apply that to my research? And that really is a skill that, you know, I didn't find necessarily I personally had out of undergrad or even really my master's. Other people might have different experiences and I really had to learn when it came to the PhD, but it is a learnable skill, you know, sit down and wow, let's not the most fun exercise, like pick a scientific journal. If you're in like math and science, you know, really go through and especially if it's your first couple of scientific papers, like go through all the proofs, try to analyze every aspect of trying to say, and then talk to someone else about it. Because if you can internalize what's going on well enough to teach someone else what's going on, it's a great exercise in figuring out what's important, what's not, how can I like, you know, read this more effectively the next time around. So I think volunteering or even in like a group meeting to present a paper is a great exercise in terms of learning how to be an independent learner. And it really helped me along the way. And another great little tool that I've been trying to implement more and more is when I see a presentation, and especially if it's research that's not um, necessarily what I work on, I always try to think of a good question offer that research. It could be a clarifying question or it could be, you know, me trying to dig deeper into one of the uh, one of the points that they made earlier on. And that just teaches me how to, you know, again, like pull out the details from the word of, in of information we get off of the Internet and really prioritize it towards some sort of goal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. And so kind of a related question for you all. How would you say graduate school like schedule wise? workload-wise has differed from undergrad? And Mahalia, do you oh. want to take this one to start with? Sure. Sure. Um, I think the biggest difference for me that has been a little bit strange is um, in my undergrad, I always felt like I was taking so many classes and I also had a job while I was in undergrad. And so my days were just like packed from morning to night and now with grad school and also with things being so online because of COVID-19, it's been interesting to sort of get to set my own schedule in a lot of ways uh, with research. Like if I want to go into the office at night instead of in the morning, I can. And uh, I think for me, that's been the big difference is I get to sort of adjust things. And I have felt a lot more competent and in control because I feel like I'm learning new things, but they apply to things I've learned before. So I feel like I have a little bit more of a base, a, a good knowledge base. Um, and I feel less lost and, and more, more ready to do things and, uh, and a little less overwhelmed, which has been very cool. And I think a fun part of grad school is it can get overwhelming, but it's a completely different kind of overwhelming than undergrad was. Right, right. I, I totally get that. And, and too, we also had a question come in the chat for you, Mahalia, related to how you've been able to kind of transfer your double E skill set into the AI field and the research that you're doing now. I mean, that must be kind of an extra layer on top of just that transition between undergrad and grad school of kind of getting into a new field or a new area. Definitely. I, um, I had the opportunity during my undergrad to take sort of a intro prin to principles of AI, um, which was really cool and interesting. And so when I reached out to the professor I'm working with to find out more about his re research, um, I think the biggest transference of, of skills from EE and my undergrad has been, I'm, I'm using MATLAB, which is a program I used during my research in undergrad. I think everyone's pretty familiar and has had to slog through all of it. Um, and so I, a lot of 
what I'm doing now is applying all of the things I learned in like signals and systems and filtering techniques that I honestly thought were a little bit like, I wasn't sure I'd ever use a lot of them, especially like digital filtering. I didn't think that was a field I was gonna end up in. And now I have a huge data set of EEG signals. And so I'm applying a lot of the theory that I learned in signal processing and filtering and determining noisy signals and different wave bands and things. Um, and so I think that's sort of the biggest transference of skills for me was I was interested in signals before and, uh, and I've been trying to find ways to use use what I've learned. I've pulled out so many old notebooks to, uh, to brush up on all of my, all of my signal skills and everything. That's awesome. And I think too, that's kind of something people don't necessarily think about is that your, your background can lead to creative new ideas and new, new research approaches that somebody who's maybe really entrenched in that field hasn't thought about just because they haven't taken that class or experienced that type of knowledge in a while. So it's, you never know what, what will come in handy someday in terms of research or new ideas or pursuing creative solutions. Definitely. So does anybody else have any comments on kind of that transition from undergrad to graduate school, some of the differences? And after this, we're going to move into a little bit about how to choose a program, funding for programs, those kind of things. Yeah, um, one of the challenges that I encountered was actually trying to find tools that could adequately, like, you know, change change my knowledge and make them at it, like, usable. Because um, from my perspective, I had a lot of book knowledge when it came to, lo like, very small-scale transistor design. Um, but before I had stepped in the lab, I had never heard of actual VLSI software like Cadence. Um, and finding the software because it's a very obscure piece of software something you never really find you really got to get in there and ask people who have done this before some of your professors and some of your colleagues um because odds are they've done it and they know the piece of software but um it, it's very hard to go out and just google this because you aren't really sure what you're looking for um but if, if you can get that that interaction in between people um, they can really help you find some software um, I don't know if anyone else has had this experience, but definitely when you're looking for some something to help you, some tool, um, that, that's the best place that I've found, because I've found a few different mm -hmm. pieces of software like that. Yeah, for sure. And you know, uh, Liam, I really appreciate that you brought up that point. I think the most like harrowing moment of my PhD was when I actually went to Google a concept that I was supposed to be interfacing with, and it's like, no results found. And it's like, you can go through that <laughs> that Google train of trying to find the magic combination of keywords that might lead you someplace that you're going, but really the best resource in grad school. Um, and it was definitely a new skill to learn, because again, I was so used to like learning in a classroom setting, is knowing how to reach out to your peers, you know, and I think there's, there's also a degree of humility that it taught me through this process that it's like, you know, you might come out of undergrad or I came out of undergrad. I'm like, oh, I have this knowledge and all these different fields and I'm sure that's enough to like get me by. But then all of a sudden deep diving into this one field, it was this juxtaposition where it's like there's people that have, that have forgotten more than I know about this field at my fingertips and learning how to approach them and being like, hey, you know, I do need help. I do need your assistant or uh, assistance um, is is very important. And additionally, going back to like the journal club idea or anything, like if you're stuck on a paper or stuck on a concept or stuck on something that you can't find the resources for, there's a lot of friends and people in similar situations that are more than happy to help you. Yeah, definitely. And I think another kind of um, transition from undergrad to grad school was just the amount of classes you take and how much work they can still be, you know, at least for, for me, you know, a, a full load of classes is nine credit hours, two classes, three hours of research. And sometimes those two classes feel like you're taking 19 credit hours as an undergrad, you know, like sometimes they can be very project heavy. I've had a lot of classes be very focused around a semester project, and that's maybe a little bit different from undergrad. Um, I had a class last fall that was you know, a final and a project, and those were your grades in the class. And so like, you know, some of that can differ a little bit, you know, maybe it's not so weekly homework based, um, but it's very dependent on your field and your university and the professors and, and all of that. 
So in the, um, with keeping time in mind, let's kind of move into choosing a program. So I guess just kind of to start generally, what did you all look for when you were choosing a program? Liam, I think you mentioned a little bit about wanting to kind of apply things and yeah. get into the lab. Um, was there anything else that you were looking for when you were trying to figure out what school, what research lab, those kind of things? Yeah, um, I actually spent a lot of time doing that um, because originally when I had graduated, um, there was like a backup plan that I would go to graduate school, but I was kind of expecting to look outwards of South Alabama where I got my bachelor's degree. Um, however, when you look at the different programs, there you know there are different programs at different universities, and so and they all have their ups and downs. Um, but really, what sold it for me at this university um, was the systems engineering program, um, which is a little different. But um, for those not familiar, the whole gimmick of systems is it's very interdisciplinary. Um, so, for example, in one lecture, we could we could talk about um, an electric car. And from there, you need the civil people talking about, you know, the automotive, the transportation, the logistics of it all. You need, you know, the, at least electric cars have vision, so you're talking to the computer science guys. Um, so that's the whole gimmick of systems engineering is it's very inter interdisciplinary. Um, and at, um, at an undergraduate level, I was allowed to sit in on some of the ICOSI uh, presentations from the department. And that's what intrigued me was I had just found interest in that department, um, you know, because I know it, um, like a similar experience. I know Mahalia was talking about she had found interest in a biomedical engineering, um, but I'll, I'll let her talk more about on that. But really, um, you know, just attend some of the uh, attend some of the conferences and um, some of the presentations and just see if it's something that you're interested in. But w would you say you had a similar experience, Mahalia, or? What, what made you decide to go over to biomedical? Um, I had a kind of similar experience. Uh, I was interested in doing something different than what I had previously like been doing. And, uh, and for me, a big factor in looking at grad schools and choosing grad schools was funding because I knew I could not afford to pay for grad school out of pocket. And I also knew that grad school is a full-time job and I, I wanted to have a little bit of income and be able to support myself in it. And so I, choosing South Alabama, a large part of it was seeing that they had the right kind of funding. Um, it was a, a bit of a smaller school, which I have always enjoyed. And, uh, and then also I had the experience of, I was just sort of chatting with, uh, my, my current PI, and then he said, I have a position open, um, and would you be interested in interviewing for it? And I did, and when he emailed back and said that he wanted to offer me a research position in his lab, I knew that I was just gonna go ahead and go for the school, because it was the right funding and the right kind of program. Um, and I, that's, I think, a huge, a huge draw for me. And also, when I was looking at programs, I definitely paid attention to, like, what city they were in, what was life going to be like near campus, on campus, and was I going to have the opportunity to collaborate with other people, which was a huge draw um, of joining my, my PI's team, is that he is very interested in working with the medical college and the mechanical engineers to really, like, round out and have a, have a broad view of what we're doing. And, uh, and I think that's something to look out for is if you want to do collaboration, you should try to find out from within the department if the professors are collaborating with people outside of the college, because um, I think that helps give you a really good wide view of what, um, what the research field really looks like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. I know when, when I was doing my master's, you know, I kind of just stayed with where I was at and continued with the same um, research advisor and those kind of things. And I was lucky enough to get a fellowship to help fund that. But from pursuing my PhD, I actually looked at and applied to a bunch of different schools before deciding to stay with the same research advisor again. Um, and in looking at those other schools, one of the big things, kind of my first search criteria was, do they have some sort of microwave engineering lab? And that was kind of point A you know, do they have kind of the general research field that I'm interested in? And then let's see what kind of research they're doing with that. 
um, bonus points if they're doing something related to space because that's really cool um, or something related to antenna design. And so then from there, I could kind of make my short list. I think, you know, something that's different about maybe applying to grad school versus undergrad is that, you know, a ton of schools have an electrical engineering program or a computer engineering program. You know, maybe a handful of schools will have a microwave engineering program that's focused on antenna design, <laughs> you know? So that was kind of a thing. And then looking at what kind of classes would they offer? You know, would there be a lot of opportunities to learn the things that I was interested in? You know, maybe there would be a professor that had a group there, but they didn't have a lot of EM related courses just because they were kind of the only professor in that area. And then again, location, um, cost of living in that area too. Um, and comparing that against kind of what they would pay their students in terms of stipends, typical rates, those kind of things. Um, you know, if you're <laughs> making $2,000 a month, but rent is $2,500 a month, that, that doesn't add up <laughs> and it's not gonna work, um, at least in my case. Um, so those are some of the factors there for me. Some of the schools I applied to, they wouldn't offer you admission unless you had guaranteed funding from somewhere within the department, whether it be a TA position or a research assistant position or a professor that was willing to take you or a departmental fellowship. Um, and so it's, it's really dependent on the university and the department again as to what's offered. But, you know, for a PhD especially, it's very common, if not, kind of the default answer to be getting a stipend and your tuition paid for and those kind of things. And for masters, it's also really common, especially for research-based, I would say. So any, any other things to look for in a program or maybe things to look out for and steer away from? Um, I've got something to add about what to look for in a program. Um, right. So I feel that the first thing you need to do is, at least from going from undergrad to graduate program, is to determine um, what you can see yourself doing for the next two, three years. Um, so really, for my personal experience, I really enjoyed the labs that had to deal with hardware. So I made sure that whatever graduate program I wanted to go to was going to have some interaction with hardware. And that was sort of the first filter that I put everything through. And then, you know, it ends up being a big Venn diagram of, you know, what has funding, where can I move? what's can, you know, works for my life. Um, but I think determining what you personally want to do first is the most important step rather than going for where it has money. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there's another question here in the chat too about, you know, it seems like none of us decided to go for a PhD right away and have that be the first step. And kind of the question here is, was that a conscious decision or is that just kind of how it happened? I mean, for me, I was I was afraid of the commitment of a PhD, of not knowing what grad school is like, and then kind of signing away four plus years <laughs> of my life to, to have a degree to leave with, you know? So that was kind of what deterred me originally. But once I got more so into grad school, then I was like, oh, I, I can do this. I'm capable of this, mm -hmm. and I want to do this. So does anybody else have any other thoughts on that? You know, uh, Katie, I really appreciate that point. I felt a very, very similar way um, when contemplating, you know, what's the next step there. And one of the reasons I decided to go for the master's versus immediately looking for PhD programs was equally some hesitation about the duration of a PhD program. I think we all hear the horror stories of that one, like, eight, nine year, year PhD student floating around the department or whatever. Um, and also, you know, second guessing my capabilities. And I think the masters really gave me the confidence to sit down for that or be confident in the next uh, four or five period uh, year period in terms of like justifying my ability to learn and do research. Um, I guess maybe there is a lesson there that it's like, at least me personally, the masters acted almost a little bit as like a crutch to build my confidence and maybe out of the bachelors, I would have been able to, to dive into that reach and field a little bit more um, wholeheartedly. But I think it was the apprehension of how long it was that really made me contemplate Yeah, yeah, I, I totally agree with, with everything that you said. I think, I know for me, part of why I didn't 
apply where I was applying for masters instead of PhDs to start with is I had a lot of fear that I was going to choose a research topic and then hate it and be stuck with it for years. And now that I've been in it for a little bit, I I know that while changing topics isn't easy, if you do dislike what you're doing, you you can start over. Um, and I think I, I thought that you were just locked in, like you're, you're stuck with whatever you choose right from the get go. And, um, and so I think a master's for me was sort of like dipping my toe in the water. Am I even going to be good at this kind of research? Am I going to enjoy it? Am I going to want to spend my life doing it? And the answer is yes. And <laughs> I think that uh, it seems like everyone I talk to who's in master's programs has had kind of a similar experience of really liking it or really hating it. It kind of, mm -hmm. it's a real defining point. Yeah, yeah. So I guess kind of the flip side of this question then is, you know, is there anything that people should be kind of wary of or red flags that if you're looking at a program and you see this kind of run the other way? So I have I have an opinion when it comes to this, but um, so when it comes to, I guess, looking at a program or particularly a lab that you're contemplating joining it really is a mixture of like three major things that were like dictate especially for a phd how those next couple of years are going to go the first is you know funding um as we kind of hinted at before you might be lucky enough to get a fellowship um the lab you're joining might have spare funds from a grant and be able to fund you or you might be able to pursue opportunities through the department through like ta or some other aspect and really seeing those opportunities at the university, like how many fellowships do they give out? Does the lab have funding? Will I have to TA for the entirety of my PhD? Should be an aspect you're contemplating because, you know, money's important and getting enough money to adequately survive in an area, especially like, you know, high cost area like Boston is very important. Um, in addition, there's also research topic. You should always join a lab that you're interested in. Um, you might not necessarily continue that research topic exactly after your PhD, but it should be giving you that skill set that you want to develop, that you find particularly interesting and you can see yourself doing for the next potentially half a decade. And the last is lab culture, whether it's is your PI a micromanager, a laissez-faire? Both of those work particularly well for different people. Or is the lab very close-knit? Are they often going out and getting like beers after works? Or are they a little bit more formal in how they present themselves? These aspects might not necessarily make a lab a bad lab, but really finding out if a lab's a good fit for you is very important. These are going to be your friends, your peers, and basically your boss for the next little while. And if you don't click with the personalities, I've seen some of my PhD friends miserable because of that. So when it's, you're investigating a program, and particularly a lab, don't be afraid to reach out to a PhD student. Usually a lot of us grad students are really happy or very happy to answer questions. So it might just be, hey, Joe, How's Lay as a PI? What's he like? Is he a micromanager? Is he not? You'll probably get some very honest responses from people in return and help you formulate if that's going to be the best fit for you. Right, definitely. I think, you know, what you said there that it's it's all about fit. You know, two people can be in the same lab and have very different experiences just because of personalities and how they work with each other, how they're looking to be supervised or managed or supported or mentored everybody kind of needs something different. So it's really about kind of finding that fit and finding what's best for you. Um, that all being said, you know, there are some PIs that maybe aren't great people. You know, there's there's some mean people in academia and that's, that's kind of the truth. Um, so, you know, always talking to grad students is a really good starting point to get some opinions, to get um, some feedback, or even, you know, if there's a PI you're interested in working with, maybe talk also to grad students in a different research group at the same university. What do they think of that research group? Maybe the students feel like they can't be completely honest there sometimes. So, you know, always talking to grad students is a great way to kind of get the, the inside scoop of, <laughs> you know, what's, what's going on and if it's going to be a good fit for you. And also, too, a lot of times when back when things are in person, you know, if you get an offer, you get the opportunity to tour that university, tour some labs, meet with people, and then you can kind of understand that dynamic a little bit better, too. Just their 
by talking with them and seeing the environment and seeing how people react and interact with each other and those kind of things. Yeah, and one thing I would like to add to that is um, even if you choose to go to grad school, um, don't feel like this is the end all and be all decision you have to make. Um, Cause I actually know a guy who he graduated with an EE degree and he wanted to go into a master's in the civil engineering program and he did. Um, and about halfway through the semester, he was like, actually, I don't like research. I'm going into industry. And he went to work. And it was, you know, it's totally OK. He went out to work, and he's having a much, he's having a blast now. He's making way more money than me. Um, so you know, d don't assume that if you sign up for a graduate program, you're stuck into it, and you have to have to stay until the end of the term. Because um, you can really do what you want to do. Um, and and, it, and you can make it flexible and work for you. You know, some people like I, like I'm a teaching assistant, so I have that on my plate. But other people are just doing research. Um, and when it comes to master's program, a lot of curriculums offer no no research, uh, just coursework. Um, so if you're interested in just more coursework for a master's, that's normally an option. Um, so you know, don't don't be afraid about that. You can really pick a curriculum that fits you. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And we have another question here in the chat too about if we know of anybody who chose not to do a PhD after completing a research-based master's, and why didn't they decide to continue? Um, you know, there's been multiple students in my lab who've, who've done that, um, and they just decided that they were ready for a job, or, you know, maybe I think part of it, too, was sometimes life decisions, you know, or life aspects. Um, they got married, and they didn't want to be on a graduate student salary anymore, and that's understandable too you know at the end of the day we're also human beings and we have other things in our lives besides school too so i think that can be an aspect too and masters versus phd there's not really one that's inherently better than the other because it's all about what do you want as a person and what will lead you down the path that you want to go down you're the one driving this car you get to pick where it goes um so we have another question here about if there were any websites that were useful for starting your search and trying to find different programs and find, you know, where where to look, does anybody have any resources off the top of their head of what what's a good place to start in this wide wide realm of possibilities? <laughs> I know that for me, not to like totally say just Google, but Google. Um, Googling lots of different random combinations of things is really what helped me in the past and also is helping me while I'm looking for PhD programs. So instead of just like electrical engineering master's programs, looking for more specific research and then, um, and then sort of going from there. And then after you see a school that you're interested in, I, something that I definitely didn't do for undergrad that I have done for looking at grad schools is looking at professors and then going and like looking them up in like conference databases and things to see what papers they may have published and sort of reading up to see if if their communication style sort of matches like what I'm looking to to get out of it. So um, Google and then following rabbit trails and just let yourself sort of fall into into like a little bit of a rabbit trail because you may end up finding a program you would have never thought to look for. Um, I've got something to add for that. Um, so contrary to using the internet and websites, I went around to professors that I enjoyed taking classes with or taught something I was interested in going to and then personally asking them, you know, what schools have you heard of that are good for this program? Um, would I like doing it? Did you graduate from there? And if they graduated from there, you can usually get a letter of recommendation from them, which will help immensely. Um, so. Although the internet is very useful, I think building the personal communication and going out and like looking for people that have done it before uh, is also helpful. Yeah, definitely. And I think relatedly, um, you know, IEEE can be a resource for that as well. You know, talking to people in your IEEE section or region or this or that, you know, there's, there's so many volunteers in this network that you can kind of reach out to and usually they're happy to help. Um, another thing that I found is just looking at IEEE Explore to find papers that I was interested in and then looking at the authors and then from there looking at, okay, what university are they at and kind of piecing it all together. Sometimes you feel like you're connecting like pictures with red strings on a bulletin board trying to figure out 
where to even start to apply. But, um, you know, it, it does take some search and some time. So I think don't underestimate that part of the process because um, it can just, you know, again, take, take some time to, to kind of figure out your short list of where you want to apply or start reaching out to. So any other thoughts on this? We have a few minutes left, so I think we can take maybe one or two more questions before we have to wrap up. Okay. So here's just kind of, we've, we've touched on this a little bit, but um, funding, you know, funding for grad school and what that's like. So the question here is, what type of funding is available to help pay for graduate studies? Um, so I can say that I have a fellowship. Um, it's a, a national fellowship, um, the NASA Space Technology Research Fellowship, and it's geared towards supporting graduate students in developing new technologies for space applications. And it pays tuition, a stipend, a research stipend, the chance to do research, health insurance, and um, traveling to conferences. So that's kind of been my experience throughout graduate school, but everybody else in my lab is supported through just a graduate research assistantship. Um, and that's what pays their tuition and their stipends. So for everybody else, you know, what, what are your thoughts on funding for grad school? Uh, well, uh, from my personal experience, my funding came from doing uh, research. And luckily I got involved with undergraduate research um, at the university I was going to already. And if, if you have the time for that, it's definitely worth it because then you show that you have some, you know, some research chops and that professors will be more likely to bring you on into the group having that previous experience. I think it's really important. Yeah, definitely. So yeah. here's, oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to add, um, definitely once you've found a program you think you might be interested in, go to like the school website and look up because uh, they usually will list what sort of graduate assistantships are available per department. And, um, and for instance, like the department Liam and I are in, uh, there's funding through the department that then gets funneled into usually a joint research TA position. And, um, and usually you can get more information from like the office administrator if you want to hear more details about what funding the school actually has and then um, instead of just external. Right, definitely. So we're going to take one last question here. And I think what we might do is maybe compile some sort of document with some of these answers, some of this information, because we've had a ton of great questions. Um, and we want to make sure we can share this information out with people in the future, too. So my last question for you all to kind of wrap up today is, what's something that you've learned since uh, starting grad school that you wish you would have known earlier? And Joe, do you want to get us started on this one? <laughs> yeah, for sure. So, oh, man, there's definitely, definitely a lot of different aspects. But I, I think the most... Um, most jarring in terms of my transition to grad school was again that um, that real focus from a course-based curriculum to a in, in more independent-based curriculum. Just in the sense that it's like, I felt like in undergrad, it was like you learned a course, then like maybe you transferred some of that to the next course, or you dump that knowledge behind to move on to the next course. And that's kind of like how I saw learning. But then all of a sudden research, you know, research is more akin to a dialogue than this like learn dump mentality that it's like by publishing a paper you're engaging with a dialogue to everyone else that you've referenced and everyone else that is going to reference you and kind of in terms of building this community where we're all like looking at each other's work and seeing how we can apply our mentality our background and our thoughts to either aid each other or disprove something or show we can do something better is just a different type of beast and I think if I was to redo grad school again, I, you know, similar to what I learned, applied a lot more to courses in those first couple of years of grad school. And really, I think applying myself more towards like reading more papers and making more connections and really pushing myself in terms of my research mentality, especially outside of my intended field, like going to talks that might not necessarily be computational imaging, I think would be very valuable. 
Any other thoughts on this? Um, I just wanted to say the thing for me, the biggest difference uh, or the biggest thing that I've learned that I wish I had known in undergrad came from working as a TA. And that's just if you're having a rough time, you should communicate it with everyone it's relevant to, whether that's a project partner, a professor, your lab group, your PI. You, you should just let people know what's going on. Cause I know as, as a TA and like grading papers and having students not show up to lab, a lot of times they would just like wait till the end of the semester and then tell me like what had been going on. And if I had known earlier, I would have been able to help them adjust their schedule and make things a little bit easier on them. And every professor I've reached out to when I've had a rough time or even just had an off week and got behind on things, they completely understand as long as they know what's going on, as opposed to just not showing up to things or, or just not doing things. Everyone is more understanding if you are upfront in your communication. And I wish that I had communicated better in under. Yeah, definitely. I think for me, one of the biggest things has just been learning how to kind of have that work-life balance. You know, sometimes academia can have this culture of overworking or kind of like the misery Olympics of like, oh, well, I only slept three hours last night. You know, I'm, I'm such a great researcher. I care so much. And that's not healthy. It's not a great culture to have. And so trying to break that cycle or not feed into that, you know, has been something important to me. And also just taking time to do things I enjoy and do things outside of just my research and try to be a whole person rather than, you know, just a researcher or just a grad student, you know, being involved with HPAN at my local chapter and more so on the global level, having something that I can pour my heart into that I really care about outside of my research and kind of diversifying what I care about, you know, it, it makes it easier when your research isn't working if you also care about other things. <laughs> and that's kind of something I've had to learn along the way. So we're at a little bit over time right now. So um, I want to try to wrap up, but if there are any, you know, last minute comments or thoughts before I pass it back to Nancy, now's your time. No? Okay. Well, well I... Katie, no, thank you so much. You've been, as always, an excellent moderator and a great, uh, you know, great advice for everyone, and we really appreciate that and value it. And Joe and Sue, Sahala and uh, William, as, very much. We really appreciate your sharing very candidly uh, your experiences about graduate school and graduate education. We know that HKN can be a help, so I want to remind people that if you're looking at graduate schools, remember there might be an HKN chapter there. Katie went from a school with a great HKN chapter to another school with a great HKN chapter and has been very involved, and HKN can be here to help you. And it might be a real, it's a great network, like let's network and help each other, right? We're all HKN. So that doesn't end at your induction, it actually continues throughout your lifetime, so I encourage you to send us some questions, you can get us at info at hkn.org. I can pass some things along. We've got other ways for you to network together, so we'll be in touch. Um, but we're your honor society. We'll be here for you. So um, if you're graduating this year, please send us your photo for our graduation celebration that's coming up on Saturday, June 5th at 5 p.m. Be a lot of fun stuff happening for the outstanding chapters and an outstanding student. We're elevating an eminent member, and we're going to celebrate and let you walk, if you would, with all of your fellow Eda Company members who are walking this year around the globe. So it'll be a very special graduation celebration for all HKN members. Thank you very much for joining us today. This will be available on demand. Um, you can share it with others and watch it again yourself. And our social media team, of which Katie and Joe and are part of, are going to make sure that this information and more information about this is available to you. Thank you very much, and have an Etta Kappa new kind of day.